Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. A few months ago, we did a tribute to some of the actors and actresses who, who passed away way too young, under 50. And it was so well received that I dug deeper and a lot of you sent in some people that you wanted us to comment on and give a little biography. So that's what we've done for an unlucky 13. These are people who've left us legacies of wonderful work, but they all died before the age of 50. In fact, two of them in this group shot where I am now in Lone Pine. Gail Russell, who did Seven Men From Now, and also Tyrone Power, who did Rawhide. This is a great spot. These are some wonderful people. Let us know if you enjoy it. Give us a comment. Give us a like and send us some names of some other performers that are your favorites that you think deserve this special treatment for those who died too young. Some of the performers we honor, you may not know. Others, you'll discover more about them and search out their films. We use the age of 50 as the cutoff for those who died too young. Of course, even though they are gone, the legacies they leave will outlast us all. And now, here are the unlucky 13 who died too young. Hellraiser was a term that described the two-fisted, beverage-loving cowboy Art Accord. His is a Western star name that is mostly unknown, even though Accord was among the top ten Western stars of the silent 1920s, he's forgotten today because he only starred in silent films and died young. Born April 17, 1890 in Stillwater, Oklahoma, Arthemus Accord grew up on the range, a working cowboy. Like most young working wranglers, Accord competed in rodeos, ultimately becoming a world championship bulldogger in 1912 and again in 1916, beating out fellow competitor Hoot Gibson. Following the path of so many out-of-work cowboys, he worked in traveling Wild West shows before heading to Hollywood, where he began appearing as an extra in one and two real silent westerns. One of the early films, Two Brothers, was directed by D.W. Griffith and featured another unbilled rodeo cowboy, his pal, and future western star, Hoot Gibson. In Hollywood's first feature film, The Squaw Man, a western directed by Cecil B. DeMille in 1914, Accord appeared again, unbilled, as a townsman. But in 1915, the tall, lean, hard-riding cowboy was starring as Buck Parvin in a series of three-reelers produced by Santa Barbara's Flying A Studios. He was even cast in Vamp Theta Barra's 1917 feature film, Cleopatra, before heading off in the Army to Europe to fight in World War I. Following service in the war, Accord starred in a couple of Western shorts, but when cast as the lead in the Moon Riders, Universal's 1920 chapter action serial, Art Accord became the top star for the company. He was quickly hustled into a follow-up serial, The White Horseman, with Art dressed in white with a flowing cape fighting against the White Spider Gang. It was another 18-chapter success. For Universal's B production unit, Blue Streak Westerns, Art was billed as the big man with a big smile, and became one of Hollywood's top ten Western stars until 1929 when talkies arrived. During the 1920s, along with Universal's other Western leading men, Harry Carey and Art's drinking buddy, Hood Gibson, he was one of the studio's most popular stars and made a series of top Westerns with titles like The Western Rover, Three in Exile, and Sky High Corral, with his wonder horse Raven and his dog pal Rex. An ad read, You'll marvel at the almost human cleverness of these animals when they rescue their master from ruin and disgrace. 
Universal paired their Western ace, Art, with King Kong's future leading lady, teenager Fay Ray in Spurs and Saddles, and with young director and future cinema legend, William Wyler in Hard Fist, both 1927. Unfortunately, Art's love of alcohol often turned him violent. He was married four times and was fired by Universal on more than one occasion. As the 1920s were ending and with talking pictures on the horizon, Art Accord made his last starring silent westerns, not at Universal, but in several Poverty Row productions directed by infamous Robert J. Horner. It was quite a comedown for Accord, and it sent him spiraling to the depths of depression and altercations with the law. Out of work and with no film slated, Art vanished. When his mutilated body was found in a motel in Chihuahua, Mexico, it was January 6, 1931. Art was 40 years old. The Mexican government claimed it was a suicide. Hoot Gibson, speaking with writer John Tusca in 1959, surmised that Accord had been caught in bed with another man's wife and was disemboweled. It wasn't no suicide, Gibson said. Gorgeous green-eyed Peggy Castle starred with John Russell and Peter Brown in the hit Western series Lawman. She was born December 22, 1927 in Appalachia, Virginia, as Peggy Blair. Her family moved to Los Angeles and her father was hired as studio manager for MGM. Peggy had begun taking theatrical courses at the age of eight. In Oakland, California, she spent two years attending Mills College, like Lana Turner's discovery eating at Schwab's in Hollywood, legend says that the beautiful blonde was spotted in L.A.'s farmer's market and signed by an agent. Making her big screen debut as one of eight Temptation Girls in the Columbia B movie When a Girl's Beautiful, she was billed as Peggy Call. While dating Universal's rising star Audie Murphy, Peggy was given a contract there and changed her name to Peggy Castle. Working her way up mostly in uncredited glamour roles in such films as Harem Girl and The Prince Who Was a Thief, Peggy's first Western was Wagons West in 1952. It gave her a prominent role and good billing alongside Rod Cameron and Noah Berry Jr. Her performance in Wagons West led to a series of co-starring roles in other early 50s big screen Westerns including Cow Country with Edmund O'Brien, Son of Bell Star, and Overland Pacific starring ex-stuntman Jock Mahoney as a brawling and, of course, two-fisted detective. And Peggy, not a saloon hostess, but as a hot, sharp-dressing heroine whose father was murdered. Lots of action from Jocko. The ads for 1954's The Yellow Tomahawk said, An Indian Scout and a Blonde Wildcat. That would be Rory Calhoun and Peggy. This Howard Koch production boasted color and a terrific cast featuring Noah Berry Jr., Peter Graves, Rita Moreno, and Lee Van Cleef as a Native American. Peggy's next Western was Jesse James' Women, directed by and starring B-Western hero Don Red Berry as Jesse. The synopsis for this one? It reads... Jesse James keeps so busy skirt-chasing that his outlaw career starts to suffer. Luckily for Peggy, her next Western starred a revenge-seeking Randolph Scott, tall man riding in 1955. Peggy vies for the love and attention of Scott with the equally attractive Dorothy Malone. There's a well-staged fight not between the two ladies, but between Scott and tough guy Mickey Simpson. In Two Gun Lady, also 1955, Peggy stars as a pistol-packing Annie Oakley-type trick shooter out to track down a killer of her father, witnessed when she was a little girl. Sounds like a spaghetti western plot, doesn't it? Two Gun Lady is very inexpensive and doesn't come up to even that level of competency. Other 50s westerns for Peggy include Quinn Cannon, Frontier Scout, and Roger Corman's The Oklahoma Woman with Richard Denning, Kathy Downs, Mike Touch Connors, and Dick Miller. 
The 1950s were filled with Western movies. It was a popular time for the genre, but Peggy also starred in other types of films. She made a couple of solid film noir movies, two based on Mickey Spillane novels, I, the Jury, and The Long Wait, plus the classic noir 99 River Street starring John Payne and directed by Phil Carlson. Television was taking the place of lower-budgeted B-movies, and Peggy started making the rounds of TV westerns. She appeared on Zane Grey Theater, Gunsmoke, Cheyenne, The Texan, and The Restless Gun before being given an opportunity that would change her life. Peggy was given the chance to join the cast of Warner Brothers' popular half-hour Sunday night western, Lawman. It was in the cushy time slot following Maverick, and the producers decided to give stern Marshal Dan Troop, a mustached John Russell, a steady love interest when Lawman entered its second season. Kinda like a Gunsmoke clone, Peggy was cast as Birdcage Saloon owner Miss Kitty, uh, M- Miss Lily, Lily Merrill. Peter Brown was Deputy Johnny McKay. Peggy's character stood out in the series and her performance solidified her standing as a popular actress. She appeared in 106 episodes of Lawman, which ran from 1958 to 1962. Peggy was married four times and had one child with her third husband. Following the end of Lawman, Peggy developed an alcohol problem, and her last on-screen appearance was in a 1966 episode of The Virginian. The still beautiful Peggy was only 41 when she was cast in the episode entitled Morgan Star, featuring John Daner. On August 11, 1973, William McGarry, Peggy's third husband, discovered her lifeless body on a couch in her Hollywood apartment. Peggy died at the age of 45 due to cirrhosis. At a towering six feet, four inches, Jeff Chandler's imposing height and chiseled features made him an appropriate choice to portray Chiricahua Apache leader Cochise in director Delmer Dave's groundbreaking 1950 classic, Broken Arrow. It dealt with Indian agent Tom Jeffords' efforts to negotiate peace. Jeffords was played by James Stewart. The film was heralded at the time as one of the first talkies to sympathetically portray Native Americans, and Chandler received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. So powerful was his performance as Cochise, Chandler reprised the role twice. The Battle of Apache Pass in 1952 was a prequel, with Chandler reunited with Jay Silverheels, a Canadian Mohawk who portrayed Geronimo in both versions. Chandler also appeared at the beginning of 1954's Taza, Son of Cochise, with Anglo Rock Hudson in the title role. Years later, Chandler and Broken Arrow leading lady Deborah Padgett, who were both Jewish, were criticized because they were white actors. Jeff Chandler was born Ira Grossel in Brooklyn, New York, December 15, 1918, and was six feet four by the time he was 15, the same time that his hair began to turn prematurely gray. Following service in World War II and possessing a powerful, deep voice, Chandler found work in radio dramas and comedies. He was especially effective in the hit radio series Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Chandler, originally billed as Ira Grossel, was her dense love interest in science teacher Mr. Boynton. Universal Pictures liked what they heard and saw. They signed him to a movie contract, gave him a movie marquee friendly name, and, as Jeff Chandler, he began appearing uncredited in several films. The studio also took advantage of Chandler's voice and he can be heard doing narration on the Desert Hawk and Abbott and Costello in the Foreign Legion. After his success in Broken Arrow, Chandler was given a leading role in director Robert Wise's unjustly forgotten western, Two Flags West, starring Joseph Cotton, Cornell Wilde, Linda Darnell, and Dale Robertson. It's the story of Confederate prisoners joining forces with Union soldiers to fight rampaging Native Americans. 
sounds kind of like Sam Peckinpah's Major Dundee, made 15 years later. Chandler's other starring westerns never measured up to the critical acclaim and financial success of Broken Arrow. They include The Great Sioux Uprising, War Arrow with Maureen O'Hara, John McIntyre, Charles Drake, Dennis Weaver, Noah Berry Jr., Henry Brandon, and Jay Silverheels, and the fourth remake of Rex Beach's Alaskan saga, The Spoilers, that boasted a rousing climactic fight between Chandler and Rory Calhoun over saloon hostess Ann Baxter, all of them in beautiful technicolor. Chandler's next two westerns shifted to widescreen black and white, both in 1957. Drango, a post-Civil War drama directed by former documentary filmmaker Hall Bartlett, is a serious look at reconstruction and hatred in a defeated Georgia town. Man in the Shadow, Chandler's other black-and-white western, is solidly directed by 1950s sci-fi horror specialist Jack Arnold. Just coming off It Came From Outer Space, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Tarantula, and the Incredible Shrinking Man, Arnold gives this modern-day western noir some grit. As town boss, Orson Welles is in fine form as a ruthless land baron and town benefactor, covering up a murder of a Mexican worker. Jeff Chandler is the sheriff up against the town. Wells and his thugs, Leo Gordon and John Larch, this solid in a Gary Cooper high noon scenario. Chandler's next two westerns were standard fare, but at least they were in color. Thunder in the Sun features top-billed Susan Hayward just coming off an Oscar win. She had known Chandler since grade school and requested him as her co-star, which gives this film, about the trek west by a group of Basque immigrants in 1850, an added dimension. The next western for Chandler would be The Jayhawkers, which is interesting for several reasons. It's set pre-Civil War, and Chandler is the villain who dreams of becoming Napoleon-like and controlling Kansas. His co-star is Davy Crockett. Well, Fess Parker, who is trying to shake off his world-renowned identification with the coon skin cap-wearing American hero. Lots of terrific talent in this film behind the camera, too. Norman Panama and Melvin Frank were the writer-producers with Frank directing, Loyal Griggs as director of photography, and a rousing score by Jerome Moros. Chandler's first film away from his universal contract is one of director-writer Sam Fuller's classic World War II dramas. Merrill's Marauders is the true story of Brigadier General Frank Merrill leading American forces in battling the Japanese in Burma. Done in 1961 and shot in the Philippines with a cast of Warner Brothers' young TV Western stars, Peter Brown, Will Hutchins, and Ty Harden, it may well be Jeff Chandler's finest performance. Unfortunately, he never lived to see it. Filming had only just begun when Chandler injured his back during a baseball game with cast and crew. This being his first film under a new contract with Warner Brothers, Chandler didn't want to stop production or have his choice role recast with another actor. So, he opted to continue filming with back pain that became more and more severe as shooting progressed. Returning to the States for surgery, the operation went awry, and Chandler got blood poisoning. Jeff Chandler died June 17, 1961, at the age of 42. Whistle me a tune that'll carry me back, back to Tombstone Territory. Six foot three inch tall Pat Conway starred as Sheriff Clay Hollister in the very popular half hour Western series, Tombstone Territory, The Town Too Tough to Die. It had one of the catchiest title songs of any TV Western during a time when competition for memorable TV theme songs was at its zenith. This one was a grabber. You had to whistle. And Pat Conway, the tall, curly-haired, blue-eyed series lead in Tombstone Territory? He should have been a bigger star. Conway was Hollywood royalty. Born January 9, 1931 in Hollywood, his father was Jack Conway, one of MGM Studios' top directors known for Boomtown, Honky Tonk, 
and Tarzan and his mate. His mother, Virginia Bushman, was the daughter of silent movie matinee idol Francis X. Bushman, star of Ben-Hur. You might say Pat Conway was born in the saddle, raised on his parents' 125-acre Pacific Palisades ranch. Young Pat was riding and roping before he was 10 years old. He studied acting at the Pasadena Playhouse and at the Old Vic in London. Signed at MGM, handsome young Conway made his feature film debut uncredited in William Wellman's Westward the Women in 1951. He was 20. Other early small parts include bits in the movies Singin' in the Rain, Scaramouche, and Rogue's March, and TV shows Highway Patrol and State Trooper, two series produced by legendary syndication and production company Ziv. In 1955, 24-year-old Pat was cast in the first of four Gunsmoke episodes. It was Obi Tater, the fifth episode of the first season. Obi Tater was played by veteran character actor Royal Dano, thought to have a fortune in gold. Conway tries to take it away from him, as does dancehall girl Kathy Adams, who gave up acting the following year to marry legendary Western writer Louis L'Amour. When Ziv was looking for a star for Tombstone Territory, a proposed Western series for ABC, they did not pick Pat Conway. He was cast as the deputy. But during the filming of the pilot, the director realized that 26-year-old Conway had more of what was needed for the series lead and reshot the first episode. Now starring Pat Conway in the role for which he would be most remembered, the series debuted October 16th, 1957, and ran for 92 episodes. Co-starring with Conway was veteran character actor Richard Eastham as editor of the Tombstone Epitaph, Tombstone's real newspaper. Eastham narrated, too, giving the very fictional stories a tinge of realism. It worked very well, and like most television westerns in the 50s, the half-hour series gave plenty of work to upcoming and veteran actors and actresses. The episodes were very well done, and Conway, exuding a cool persona that his two-gun-toting lawman was both tough and fair, handled the writing and much of the action himself. An unusual visual aspect to the series was adding aerial shots of Conway and others galloping on horseback. Talk about real excitement. Conway doing his own writing, going flat out with aerial tracking shots. No other Western series could come close to duplicating that. When Tombstone Territory was canceled by ABC, Ziv did something else that was different. Already a proven syndication distributor with series Highway Patrol and Sea Hunt, the company continued shooting Conway's series and took it successfully into syndication, combining new episodes with those already produced. Following Tombstone Territory, Pat Conway made the rounds, guest starring on other westerns including Rawhide, The Texan, Iron Horse, Empire, Branded, The Loner, Rawhide, three episodes of Bonanza, and another four on the long-running Gunsmoke. Conway had a co-starring role in Geronimo with top build Chuck Connors. Conway's last role was in the non-Western TV series The Streets of San Francisco. On April 24, 1981, Pat Conway died in Santa Barbara at the age of 50. According to IMDb, it was of kidney failure and dehydration secondary to acute alcoholism. Shane, come back. Come back, Shane. Who can forget young Brandon DeWilda's plaintive cry as Alan Ladd, the wounded gunfighter, rides off into the sunset? In 1954, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences recognized the young actor by awarding him with a nomination as Best Supporting Actor. Born Andre Brandon DeWilda into a showbiz family April 9, 1942 in Brooklyn, Brandon made his Broadway debut at the age of nine in the hit play The Member of the Wedding. When the acclaimed production was made into a film directed by Fred Zinnemann in 1952, the talented blonde youngster repeated his award-winning stage role and received a Golden Globe Award as Best Juvenile Actor. The very next year, the wonderkind actor was hired in the pivotal role of Joey Starrett in Shane, 
a film many consider the best Western ever made. It certainly sits very high on my list of favorites. Brandon becomes the eyes of the audience. He and we first glimpse the reluctant gunfighter Alan Ladd as he rides onto the Starrett Ranch with the mighty Grand Tetons in the background. The story may be typical, settlers versus cattlemen, but the handling by director George Stevens is emotional and thrilling. Cast is DeWilda's loving parents are Van Heflin and Gene Arthur, both superb. As Shane, Alan Ladd was never better. After beating up one of Cattle Baron Riker's men, he hangs up his guns, only temporarily, and sides with Starrett and the other settlers. When villainous assassin Jack Palance arrives, you just know the six guns will be strapped back on. The relationship that develops between Shane and Joey progresses naturally from curiosity to hero worship. Brandon doesn't miss a beat. The memorable scene in which Shane shows a wide-eyed Joey the power of a gun is one of the best in a movie filled with unforgettable moments. Both DeWilda and Jack Palance were nominated Best Supporting Actor and lost to Frank Sinatra from For Here to Eternity. Brandon's next Western began as another highly anticipated collaboration between James Stewart and director Anthony Mann. It was Night Passage, with Audie Murphy cast as Stewart's outlaw brother. When Mann walked from the project, TV director James Nielsen took over. I like this film for many reasons, Brandon's charming presence being one of them. Other pluses include the stunning color photography in Colorado, the Durango-Silverton narrow-gauge train, Dan Duryea, and of course, Stewart and Murphy. James Stewart befriends runaway DeWilda and stows a box of money with him during an exciting train robbery. The relationship with the two of them is very believable, and Stewart even gets to play his accordion and sing. Yep, sing. Going from a popular child actor to an adult performer is like walking a thin line and success is rare. Brandon seemed to make that awkward adolescent age transition with his portrayal in 1963's HUD. The Wilda is the impressionable 17-year-old nephew of Paul Newman in the film, an adaptation of Larry McMurtry's novel Horseman Pass By. HUD won Oscars for leading actress Patricia Neal and Best Supporting Actor for Aging Melvin Douglas as a morally righteous and stern patriarch, grandfather to DeWilda. It's a classic modern western directed by Martin Ritt and beautifully shot in black and white by James Wong Howe. Brandon not only holds his own as an actor with the other three veteran performers, but he was also present at the Academy Awards and accepted on behalf of Douglas, who was too ill to attend the ceremony. Brandon's other westerns include three appearances on The Virginian, one from the first season in 1962, the seventh season, and his third during the show's ninth and last year when it became The Men from Shiloh in an episode entitled Gun Quest. Brandon was even cast in The Deserter, a spaghetti western filmed in Almeria, Spain and directed by Burt Kennedy with an all-star cast of icons, including Chuck Connors, Ricardo Montalban, Slim Pickens, Richard Crenner, Woody Strode, Patrick Wayne, and John Huston. In 1972, while driving his camper van in Denver, Colorado to visit his wife in the hospital, Brandon lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a parked truck which flipped his van on its side, pinning Brandon inside the wreck. He had not been wearing a seatbelt. Brandon DeWilda died of multiple injuries on July 6, 1972, at the age of 30. With the signature command, Head him up! Move him out! Six foot, three and a half inch tall Eric Fleming rode tall in the saddle as trail boss Gil Favor in the classic Western series Rawhide. Born Edward Hetty on the 4th of July in 1925 in Santa Paula, California, the rugged looking actor was not born with his chiseled features. According to IMDb, having hopped a freight train to Chicago at the age of eight to get away from an abusive father, Fleming was involved in gang fights and ended up hospitalized before being returned to his mother in California. 
and later, while serving in World War II as a CB in the Pacific Theater, his face was shattered when a 200-pound block of steel slipped from a hoist above and crushed his face. Multiple surgeries later, the face we all know from Rawhide came to be. Following the war, he appeared on stage in Chicago and New York, now billed as Eric Fleming. Starring roles in several sci-fi and fantasy films followed, including Conquest of Space and the color cult embarrassment, Queen of Outer Space with Zsa Zsa Gabor in 1958. Westerns were next with Fleming cast as a solemn preacher in 1959's Curse of the Undead. The preacher must save his girlfriend, Kathleen Crowley, from sinister gunslinger Michael Pate, in reality, a blood-sucking vampire. It was, and still is, a rather enjoyable mixture of horror and Western genres. Fleming's role as a man with strong principles and moral fiber would become hallmarks of his greatest role, the trail boss character he personified on Rawhide. Rawhide premiered as a mid-season replacement on CBS January 9, 1959 at 8 p.m. with Incident of the Tumbleweed, an episode about a prison wagon that had nothing to do with the cattle drive. The hour-long series aired opposite ABC's hit Disneyland, both broadcast in black and white, and NBC's color detective series Ellery Queen starring George Nader. Eric Fleming was perfect for the role, and his commanding presence was the rock upon which the series was built. Clint Eastwood, another relatively unknown actor, co-starred as Ramrod Rowdy Yates. They were well-matched and perfectly cast. The weekly stories revolved around a cattle drive from Texas to Missouri and the people and problems the drovers encountered on the trail. Sort of a road movie on horseback. Many of the moral issues that were dealt with the show are still pertinent today and has helped keep the series popular in repeat airings. As Gil Favor, Fleming always made his tough trail boss's stern choices believable. It's about the herd getting through, damn it, no matter what. Unlike Wagon Train, where the story centered on guest stars and mostly took place on a soundstage, the much more realistic and rugged character studies on Rawhide dealt with the problems faced by Favor and his crew, which included a terrific array of regulars. Due to the cattle and livestock being such an important part of the show, this Western series spent more time outdoors than other Westerns of the era. That location advantage plus crisp black and white photography only added to the documentary field. Wardrobe was realistic, too. Eric Fleming's heavy leather batwing chaps didn't just look authentic. They were a necessity of the trade. When Fleming left the series at the end of the seventh season and a hoped-for career in features, Rowdy Yates, Clint Eastwood, became the trail boss, and the series limped into its eighth and final season, producing only 13 episodes before being canceled. Attempting to expand his image, Eric joined singer-comedian Doris Day, Rod Taylor, and Paul Lind in Frank Tashlin's slapstick spy spoof, The Glass Bottom Boat. He next appeared on Bonanza as a hard-bitten peace officer in February 1966, who was tracking down a band of punks with Michael Landon. It was directed by William Whitney, who hired Fleming back for a dramatic two-part episode to kick off the new season of Bonanza, with Fleming as a persecuted Mormon rancher with two wives, Lois Nettleton and Dina Merrill. Sadly, Fleming would never have a chance to see the finished show. While filming High Jungle for MGM in Peru, Eric Fleming came out of his dugout canoe in the rapids of the Hula Gala River and drowned. It was September 28, 1966. Fleming's mutilated body was recovered three days later. He was 41 years old. She was brilliant, beautiful, quirky, talented, and gone too soon. I'll never forget Joan Hackett's performance in two very different westerns, Will Penny and Support Your Local Sheriff. Both classics and both blessed with unforgettable moments of Hackett's unique individuality on display. 
Joan Hackett was born March 1, 1934 in New York and became a fashion model before making a name for herself on Broadway and appearing in many very early 60s TV series. Joan's first Western was a 1962 hour-long black-and-white episode of Gunsmoke, The Widow, directed by Ted Post. Joan is the arrogant widow of an army officer who was killed in battle. She wants to find his corpse, which means breaking the treaty and crossing into the Native American land. It's an unsympathetic portrait of a strong-willed, desperate woman. Her next Western was another 1962 hour-long series, Empire. In this modern Western, Hackett's character is about to become a nun and enter a convent but is trapped in a town filled with wild cowboys on a weekend spree. Joan made her feature film debut with other rising actresses in Sidney Lumet's The Group in 1966. Based on Mary McCarthy's bestseller, the soap opera story follows eight women who graduate from Vassar, go their separate way, and the highs and lows in their lives. Among the cast was Richard Mulligan, who married Joan. Hackett's next Western was a true classic, Will Penny. Charlton Heston is an aging, illiterate cowboy who comes to the aid of a widow and her young son. Written and directed by Tom Grise, who cast his own non-actor son, John, in a major role. Heston is being dogged by a gang of cutthroats led by Donald Pleasance that includes Bruce Dern. Heston has said that the character Will Penny was his favorite role. It's easy to see why. The wonderful relationship that develops between him and Hackett is heartbreaking. She is dignified, loving, and funny. What a combination. John Grise told me that Joan helped him tremendously during filming and brought an authenticity to their performances as they fought for survival. When the movie ends, Heston, uneducated but sensitive, leaves without her, and she is left alone with her son. It is a devastating and honest conclusion. Joan Hackett showed her versatility in her next Western, going from a heartbreaking frontier woman to a very silly frontier gal in Support Your Local Sheriff, a Western parody and love letter to the genre directed by Burt Kennedy and written by Bill Bowers. James Garner is perfectly cast as a man just passing through town on his way to make his fortune in Australia. He reluctantly takes a position as the town sheriff due to his prowess with a gun and meets the mayor's daughter, a lovesick Joan Hackett. Every time she sees Garner, Hackett gets flustered. She catches on fire, wallows in the muddy streets, and gets stuck in a tree hiding from Garner. There is an abundance of both physical and verbal comedy in Support Your Local Sheriff, and Joan hysterically matches Garner's rhythm with each and every encounter. The superb cast includes Bruce Dern doing comedy this time, Harry Morgan, Gene Evans, Walter Brennan, and the irreplaceable Jack Elam as Garner's loopy deputy. Roy Huggins, the creator of Garner's Maverick and the Rockford Files, next cast Joan in The Young Country, a TV movie pilot about a young gambler starring Peter Duell, Walter Brennan, Roger Davis, and Joan. It wasn't picked up, but shortly after it aired, March 17, 1970, the story was repurposed and it became Alias Smith & Jones, with Ben Murphy replacing Roger Davis. Joan guest starred in an episode of Alias Smith & Jones entitled The Legacy of Charlie O'Rourke as a saloon singer who knows where $100,000 in stolen gold is buried and gets Smith & Jones to help her get it. She was on display as a con artist and a singer. Joan also appeared in an episode of Daniel Boone and two episodes of Bonanza. Her last Western feature film was also Roy Rogers' last movie, 1979's Macintosh and TJ. Roy plays a drifter who teaches a young boy, Clay O'Brien, the importance of work, truth, being respectful to women, and other life lessons about what it means to be a good man and a cowboy. It's a fitting swan song for the king of the cowboys. In 1981, Joan joined Marsha Mason to co-star in Only When I Laugh, Neil Simon's movie adaptation of his play The Gingerbread Lady. 
Hackett won a Golden Globe and an Academy Award nomination as Best Supporting Actress. When Joan attended the Oscar ceremonies, she did so in a wheelchair, her body already ravaged by cancer. She died October 8, 1983, at the age of 49. With over 90 credits to his name and three heirs to his acting legacy, character actor Ed Hinton should be more well-known. Born in Wilmington, North Carolina, March 26, 1919, Edgar Latimer Hinton III made his way to Hollywood in the late 1930s where he worked mostly in theater. He was married to producer Hal Roach's daughter, Margaret, from 1942 to 1945. Following naval service in the war, Hinton began appearing in small parts, uncredited in numerous films. He portrayed a corporal in The Red Badge of Courage with Audie Murphy. Ed would work with Audie again, but not until 1956, in Walk the Proud Land, one of Murphy's best. In Leadville Gunslinger, a Rocky Lane Republic B Western action fest, Ed was cast and credited as Deputy Ned Smith, aiding Rocky and his saddle pal Eddie Waller. Ed's next Western, also 1952, was Hellgate, a neglected Lippert production and a retelling of Dr. Samuel Mudd imprisoned for treating John Wilkes Booth that was written and directed by Charles Marcus Warren. Loaded with an extraordinary cast, Sterling Hayden is the doctor, Ward Bond, the warden, James Arness is a fellow prisoner, with Robert J. Wilkie, John Picard, Sheb Woolley, Kermit Maynard, Timothy Carey, and many other Western veterans. Ed's third 1952 Western was Cattletown, starring Dennis Morgan, Rita Moreno, and a very young Amanda Blake. Television was coming into its own in the 1950s, and doors were opening for versatile character actors on the many network and syndicated shows being produced. Ed made four appearances with Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels on The Lone Ranger, Two appearances on The Cisco Kid, the popular syndicated western starring Duncan Ronaldo and Leo Carrillo. Two episodes of the Gene Autry produced The Adventures of Champion. One of them, King of the Rodeo, had Shady Ed joining forces with Rick Ballin to capture Champion, the Wonder Horse, and turn him into a bucking devil horse. Westerns were beginning their boom, and so was Ed, with roles on most of the top series of the era including Sky King, The Roy Rogers Show, and two each on Buffalo Bill Jr., Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, Death Valley Days, Tales of the Texas Rangers, and four episodes each on Circus Boy and The Adventures of Ren 1010, and heralding in the adult western four episodes and four different characters on the life and legend of Wyatt Earp. Other top series that hired Ed for mostly villainous roles include Sugarfoot, Broken Arrow, Tombstone Territory, Wagon Train, Cimarron City, and The Rough Riders. Some of Hinton's other Western features are The Dalton Girls with Johnny Western, Shootout at Medicine Bend with Randolph Scott, James Garner, and Angie Dickinson, Tension at Table Rock, Fort Bowie with Ben Johnson, filmed in Kanab, Utah. The Fiend Who Walked the West, a Western remake of Kiss of Death with Hugh O'Brien and Robert Evans. And Good Day for a Hanging with Fred McMurray and newcomer Robert Vaughn. During those early 50 years, Ed worked nonstop, but he did hesitate long enough to get married in October 1950 to Marilyn Jean Mao. They had three very adorable children who followed Ed into the acting business. Two daughters, Darcy and Darren, and a boy, Darby. It was a fun, loving family. Ed's best friends were carousing buddies Tyrone Power and Errol Flynn. Darby says they were called the Three Amigos. Unfortunately, tragedy struck while the family was vacationing at Toyon Bay on Catalina Island in October 1958. Ed was called back to the mainland by Fox Studios to prepare for location filming in Kanab. Ed boarded a single-engine seaplane and, as it took off, Marilyn and the three children watched and waved. Then, the plane turned back, flying low so that Ed could also wave goodbye. But a gust of wind 
deflected from a 40-foot cliff, hit the small plane, pushing it back, back. As the family watched in horror, the plane slammed into the cliff where it crashed, killing both Ed and the pilot. Ed Hinton died, but not before seeing the birth of his third child six months earlier. He would carry on the acting name. It's Darby Hinton, who now bears a striking resemblance to his father, who was only 39 when on October 12, 1958, he died too young. In America, his is an unknown name in the Western genre. Handsome and blonde, Peter Lee Lawrence starred in many spaghetti westerns during his short-lived career. But who is he? Even dedicated American film buffs don't know him or his films because most were never released in the United States. He was a huge international star, and in seven years, he made 17 westerns. In Europe, a lot of myths have been circulating about his death. Did he die of a brain tumor? or did he commit suicide? He was born Karl Heirenbach, February 21, 1944, in Bavaria, Germany, and made his uncredited film debut as the brother-in-law of Lee Van Cleef in For a Few Dollars More in 1965. It was a small part, but certainly the right film to help launch his career as a future Western star. Sometimes billed as Arthur Grant, he starred in 16 more spaghetti westerns and was particularly popular in Cuba. I read a comment from a woman who grew up in Cuba under Castro. She said that no American movies were allowed in the country, so films from Mexico and Europe, mostly Spain and Italy, were the main sources of filmed entertainment. She recalled that she and her girlfriends could hardly wait for the next Peter Lee Lawrence movie to arrive. For them, he was a gorgeous superstar. As most of you know, spaghetti westerns often had multiple titles, even in the same country. Of course, I've always loved the cool names given to these films, and the names of Peter Lee Lawrence films were no exception. His movies had titles like a Pistol for a Hundred Coffins, Death on Skull Mountain, Days of Violence, I'll Kill Him in Return, Alone, More Dollars for the McGregors, Four Gunmen of the Holy Trinity, and Raise Your Hand, Dead Man, You're Under Arrest, to name a few. The film that made him a star was called Killer Caliber 32 in 1967. He played an iconic character in the film, an elegant bounty hunter, dressed all in black, tracking down seven masked men. In The Man Who Killed Billy the Kid, Lawrence played a very fictionalized Billy the Kid, who was pals with Pat Garrett and is gunned down not by Garrett, but by a friend. The movie met with such resistance that it was retitled for re-release as Shades of Sergio Leone for a few bullets more. Peter met his wife, Christina Galbo, in 1967 during the filming of The Fury of Johnny Kidd, also known as The Ultimate Gunfighter. It was a variation of Romeo and Juliet set out west and featured horror movie icon Paul Nashi in his only spaghetti western as Blackie, a notorious gunfighter who gives advice to young Johnny Kidd, Peter, who is seeking revenge for his murdered family. Spaghetti Western historian Tom Betts spoke with Lawrence's widow, Christina Galbo, and set the record straight about her husband's death. In 1972, Peter began suffering from severe, constant headaches. Once filming finished on Los Caballeros in 1974, he was taken to a hospital in Madrid for surgery that revealed he had glioblastoma. He moved to Zurich and began both chemo and radium treatment. He was readmitted to the hospital with severe stomach pains, which caused his death at the age of 30 on April 20th, 1974. While Richard Long was cast into Orson Welles' movies right out of Hollywood High School, he is best known as Barbara Stanwyck's attorney son, Jared Barkley, on the popular Western series, The Big Valley. He was born Richard McCord Long, December 17, 1927, in Chicago. 
Wong's family moved to Los Angeles, where he attended Hollywood High and took an interest in performing in school plays. A talent agent spotted the handsome six-footer when he was a senior appearing in a play and arranged for the 17-year-old Long to make his film debut right out of high school, cast as the son of Orson Welles in the 1946 drama Tomorrow is Forever. His second feature film, again starring Welles, is the noir classic The Stranger, directed by Welles, with Edward G. Robinson as a Nazi hunter. Signed by Universal International and groomed for stardom, Long played one of the kettle brood in the Claudette Colbert-Fred McMurray comedy, The Egg and I, which featured scene stealers Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride as Ma and Pa Kettle. A popular series of kettle comedies followed and Long went with them for three sequels. In Richard Long's first Western, Kansas Raiders in 1950, he was cast as Frank James, Portraying Jesse, the lead, was another newcomer, Audie Murphy. The cast was loaded with other young Universal International contract players, including Tony Curtis as Kit Dalton, with James Best and Dewey Martin as the Younger Brothers. Quantrill was movie veteran Brian Donlevy. Long's next Western was a beautiful Technicolor feature directed by Raul Walsh called Saskatchewan, starring Alan Ladd as a Canadian Mountie and Jay Silverheels as his partner. Also in the cast were Shelley Winters, J. Carol Nash, and Hugh O'Brien. It was shot in Alberta, Canada, taking full advantage of the stunning locations at Banff and Lake Louise. Fury at Gunsight Pass is a little-known Western that combines a bank robbery, a wedding, double-crossing outlaws, hidden money, and a terrific windstorm climax. Richard Long is the determined groom who's got to do what a man's got to do to save his murdered father's reputation and the bank. He's very good in this role. The outlaws are led by quarreling Neville Brand and David Bryan. After his universal contract expired... Richard Long moved into the medium that welcomed him with multiple guest parts in a wide variety of genres. His TV westerns include Wagon Train, Have Gun, Will Travel, Tales of Wells Fargo, and The Outlaws. When Long signed with Warner Brothers, he was put to use in most of their top westerns, Sugarfoot, Lawman, and created a recurring role in their biggest western hit, Maverick, as Gentleman Jack Darby. Long is in perhaps the finest example of the Maverick Brothers' con and cunning. It's season two's Shady Deal at Sunny Acres, where Brett Maverick, James Garner, is fleeced by a banker played by the marvelous John Daner. If you can't trust your banker, who can you trust? The con is on to get Brett's money back, and a roundup of characters from previous Maverick episodes arrive to help. Jack Kelly's brother Bart, of course, and Long's gentleman Jack Darby, Leo Gordon's big Mike McComb, Diane Brewster's Samantha Crawford, and Ephraim Zimbalist Jr.'s dandy Jim Buckley. Directed by Leslie Martinson, written by Douglas Hayes and Roy Huggins, Maverick won an Emmy that year as Best Western Series. Warner's studio liked what they saw in Richard Long and cast him as the lead in his own series, 1959's Bourbon Street Beat. When that series ended, they carried him over as the same character Rex Randolph to a sister detective series, the long-running 77 Sunset Strip. In 1957, Richard Long married the talented and beautiful actress Mara Corday. They had a tumultuous relationship and separated on several occasions, However, when Long suffered a heart attack in April 1961, they reconciled and remained married. Richard's next series, launched in September 1965, still has a big following. It's the Big Valley, and it was a ratings bonanza. Yes, I said bonanza. There are similarities. The matriarch and owner of a massive ranch in each series was a single parent, raising a very diverse group of grown children. But instead of Pa Cartwright, we had Ma Barkley. Miss Barbara Stanwyck starred as widowed Victoria Barkley. Besides having a female in charge, there were other differences between the Barkley family and the Cartwright men. For one thing, the Barkley boys had a sister, the beautiful Linda Evans as Audra. Peter Breck was hard-headed Nick. 
Jared, Richard Long's role was the eldest son, level-headed and an attorney. Another difference was young Heath, Lee Majors. As Victoria said in the first episode, you are Tom Barkley's bastard son. Following four years of Western action, Long was top billed in a half-hour family comedy with Juliet Mills as The Nanny and the Professor. The series lasted two years. A lifelong smoker, Long had continued to suffer from cardiac problems and died of multiple heart attacks December 21, 1974, at the age of 47. The astonishingly handsome Tyrone Power was one of the most popular stars during the golden age of Hollywood, especially among women. Born May 5, 1914, Tyrone Edmund Power III in Cincinnati, Ohio, Tyrone Power is referred to as Tyrone Power Jr. His great-grandfather, Tyrone Power, had been a famous Irish comedian, and his father, billed in silent films and on stage as Tyrone Power, gets confusing, doesn't it? Made his only talking movie in 1930, The Big Trail. That's right. Power Sr. was the gruff villain in the first starring film of Marion Michael Morrison, rechristened John Wayne for the Western epic. Tyrone the Younger had been promised a small part in the sound remake of The Miracle Man to star his father and was in Hollywood when his father died of a heart attack. Doing bits in movies, Ty appeared unbilled in his first Western, 1935's Northern Frontier starring Kermit Maynard. In 1936, Ty signed with 20th Century Fox, and after roles in several undistinguished films, he became an overnight sensation in Lloyd's of London in 1938, quickly becoming the studio's biggest male star. His first starring Western was Jesse James in 1939, a blockbuster. It was a year that included some of Hollywood's best-remembered films. Power's portrayal of a victimized and very whitewashed outlaw was a smash. In the three-strip Technicolor production, Power led a cast of other 20th Century Fox contract players, including Henry Fonda as Frank James, Nancy Kelly, Jane Darwell, Brian Donlevy, Henry Hull, and John Carradine as Bob Ford, who shoots Jesse in the back at the end of the film. Others in the cast included Randolph Scott. In 1940, Ty had one of his most popular and defining roles, Zorro as both the deceptively effeminate Don Diego wooing beautiful Linda Darnell and as the masked swashbuckler in dazzling fencing displays with Basil Rathbone, power was breathtaking. Director Ruben Mamoulian's movie mixed action, humor, and social commentary to create a timeless classic. Power's comedic delivery was never more delightful, and the final sword fight between Ty and Basil Rathbone it has more thrills and daring do than that of Rathbone and Errol Flynn when they encounter each other in the adventures of Robin Hood. That's excellent, too, I might add. Another Western adventure in 1940, Brigham Young, directed by Henry Hathaway, had top build power heading west to Utah in 1844 with Mormons and Brigham Young, the title character played by Dean Jagger. The Alabama hills of Lone Pine, California doubled as the promised land of Utah, and they looked magnificent. Fox contract players Linda Darnell, John Carradine, Jane Darwell, and Brian Donlevy were along for the trek to Salt Lake City. Vincent Price gave a subdued performance as the persecuted and murdered Mormon Joseph Smith. World War II interrupted Power's perch at the top of Fox. When he returned from service, his still extremely handsome face was weathered and, much like James Stewart after the war, the actor lobbied for more suitable roles. He got them in The Razor's Edge and Nightmare Alley, perhaps his finest performance. Box office success was elusive and his last film under contract after 13 years with Fox was a black-and-white western. Surprisingly, it is a wonderful film that gets better with each viewing. The little-known Henry Hathaway film is called Rawhide from 1951 and is not to be confused at all with the hit TV series about a cattle drive starring you-know-who. Tyrone Power is matched in beauty and acting ability with Susan Hayward. They are fascinating to watch together and bring their characters vividly to life. 
Ty is the son of a stage line owner, learning the business in a lonely way station with grizzled Edgar Buchanan. Hayward arrives at the station with a baby in tow. Before you can say prison break, convicts take over the station as they wait for a gold shipment. Lots of suspense and twist in this Lone Pine shot feature and a cast of veterans all delivering top performances. Hugh Marlowe, Dean Jagger, a very long way from Brigham Young, Jack Elam, George Tobias, and Jeff Corey round out the cast in a script by Dudley Nichols and made during the golden age of Western films. No longer at Fox, Tyrone Power signed with Universal and made two Westerns for the studio. Pony Soldier 1952 cast him as a Canadian mounted police constable who must rescue a white captive from the Cree tribes. Not filmed in Canada, but Sedona, Arizona, the photography is beautiful and the location stunning. Included in the cast are Cameron Mitchell, Thomas Gomez, Robert Horton, and Penny Edwards. Next Western for Power, also at Universal, used the studio's long standing and famed riverboat. The movie is Mississippi Gambler, which became one of Hollywood's most successful films in 1953. It was especially sweet for him because not only was Power exceptionally good in this role, but he was also a producer and a percentage partner on the surprisingly profitable movie. The story has Power and John McIntyre as honest gamblers working the river's posh paddlewheel palaces. Ty wins a valuable heirloom necklace from New Orleans aristocrat Piper Laurie. Also vying for romance with power is beautiful Julia Adams. Brief early roles for Guy Williams and Anita Ekberg add to the fun. Power's off-screen affair with Ekberg hastened the end of his already tenuous marriage. Halfway through filming the biblical epic Solomon and Sheba in Spain for director King Vidor, Power had a massive heart attack during a sword fight with co-star George Sanders. A lifetime smoker, he died a few minutes later on November 15, 1958. Tyrone Power was 44 years old. The movie continued with Yul Brynner stepping in to replace him. In the long shots included in the finished film, you can still spot Tyrone Power as Solomon. Gail Russell's hauntingly romantic performance is a Mormon in love with a gunslinger. In the 1947 Western classic Angel and the Bad Man brought her critical acclaim and rumors of a romance with leading man John Wayne. That year, Gail was voted the star of Tomorrow by film exhibitors, but... The emotionally fragile young starlet's career was to be as brief as it was meteoric. Gail Russell was born September 21, 1924 in Chicago. She grew up extremely shy and as a little girl at home would hide from guests of her parents. When she was 14, her family moved to Santa Monica, California where they lived in poverty with Gail sleeping on newspapers in the living room. Blue-eyed young Gail was radiantly beautiful and had an otherworldly aura about her that attracted attention and admirers. While still a teenager in high school, she was discovered and signed to a movie contract at Paramount. The painfully shy young girl was thrown into the studio system, groomed as a star, and rushed into movies. Her first was a small role in Henry Aldrich Gets Glamour. Gail officially debuted in The Uninvited in 1944, starring Ray Milland. It was a hit, followed by another hit, Our Hearts Were Young and Gay. Lacking self-confidence and to calm her already fragile nerves, Gail began drinking. She was whisked into a series of other features, including two with above-title billing with Paramount's biggest star, Alan Ladd, Salty O'Rourke, and Calcutta. Her first Western was The Angel and the Bad Man in 1947. A Republic Western filmed in Sedona, Arizona, it was the first film John Wayne produced. Duke plays Quirt Evans, a feared gunman and on the run. Wounded, he takes shelter in a settlement of Quakers. Russell is the young daughter in the family who hides Wayne and nurses him back to health. During that time, she falls in love and Wayne questions his violent ways. They are both very good, and the movie was a hit. The pair created on-screen magic and had a rumored off-screen affair. 
According to a UPI news story, Gail was named in the divorce suit between Wayne and his second wife, Esperanza. Duke denied the allegation. Still combating her stage fright with alcohol, Gail again co-starred with Wayne, a sea captain in the 1860s Republic production, Wake of the Red Witch. A love triangle set in the South Pacific, the film is remembered for Wayne's robust performance and his fight with a giant octopus. It's the same octopus that Bela Lugosi battled in Edward D. Wood's Bride of the Monster. John Wayne took the name of his production company, Batjack, from a fictional shipping company in this film. El Paso, in 1949, was Gale's next Western. She is the girlfriend of attorney John Payne and the daughter of a crooked, drunken judge, Henry Hull. Even filled with a top supporting cast including George Gabby Hayes, Sterling Hayden, Dick Ferran, and Mary Beth Hughes, El Paso was an average Western of the period, with the advantage of being filmed in Cinecolor. In 1949, Gail married rising star Handsome Guy Madison. They looked like Hollywood's golden couple. And Gail even took up one of Guy's hobbies, archery. Guy would go on trips with stuntman Dick Farnsworth using only a powerful bow and arrow to hunt wild boar. Gail also became very proficient in the sport. But Gail's alcoholism worsened. Her drinking affected her work and her marriage. She divorced Guy in 1954. They had no children and she never remarried. In 1955, Gail was arrested for drunk driving and convicted of a misdemeanor hit and run. She had not made a film for five years, but Duke once again came to her aid, not as a co-star, but as her employer helping her and hoping for a comeback. Duke was producing the first of what would be a classic series of westerns written by Burt Kennedy and directed by Bud Bedecker. The film was Seven Men From Nell. Originally written with Duke in mind, the star instead committed to John Ford's new project, The Searchers, and the lead role went to Randolph Scott. Even though her drinking had gotten worse and she looked 20 years too old for the part, Gail Russell was cast as the female lead. Gail gave this part her all and her scenes with Scott are very moving. Her special quality of beauty and sadness creates a believable woman torn between her weak-willed husband and the stoic heroism of Scott. Seven Men From Now was a success, but sadly, a comeback for Gail didn't happen. Gail's drinking increased, turning her life into one of alcohol and seclusion. Writer-producer Andrew Finity, who had a habit of casting veterans in all of his productions, cast Gail in an episode of The Rebel, Noblesse Oblige. It was her last Western. Her last movie was The Silent Call in 1961. It was a family film about a boy and the dog he left behind. Gail was top billed and did a fine job as the mother, but she looked old, way beyond her years. As her downward spiral continued, Gail was living alone in a cluttered West Los Angeles apartment. On August 26, 1961, Gail was found dead in her bottle-littered living room. Her death certificate says that she died of severe, acute, and chronic alcoholism. She was 36 years old. Longtime B-Western leading man Tom Tyler was born Vincent Markowski on August 9, 1903 in Port Henry, New York, Young Vincent worked his way west as a seaman, lumberjack, circus strongman, and a champion weightlifter. His physical strength and weightlifting prowess would later get him a position on the 1928 Olympic team. As a handsome, tall young man with a superb physique, he had the looks of a movie star. It's what he always wanted to be. When he showed up in Hollywood in 1923 with a stack of 8 by 10s he found an agent and as Vincent Markowski was given a small part in the silent action serial Leather Stocking, starring James Pierce. He joined another future star, Gary Cooper, in 1925's Wild Horse Mesa, starring Jack Holt. Both were uncredited. 
While working on Ben-Hur, even though he couldn't write, he signed a star in a series of westerns for Joseph P. Kennedy's company, FBO. The company was looking to groom a replacement in case their reigning western film star, Fred Thompson, demanded too much money. According to film historian John Tuska, Tom Tyler, no longer Vincent Markowski, was signed for $75 a week. Thompson was earning $6,000 a week. Tyler learned how to ride very quickly and handled himself like a true movie hero. His first starring film, Let's Go Gallagher, paired him with little seven-year-old Frankie Darrow, a dynamic youngster who did most of his own stunts. The film was successful, and soon the duo was building a base of fans, clamoring for more westerns with the two. Tyler's transition to talkies went smoothly. He had a voice befitting his cowboy hero image. The problem became the quality of his westerns. Unlike contemporaries Hoot Gibson, Buck Jones, and Ken Maynard, Tom didn't sign with a major studio, but with syndicate films, and the ironically named Poverty Row Company, Reliable Pictures. Tom's first talkie was as the star of a serial, Battling with Buffalo Bill. It was popular and filled with action typical of the genre, and was the first of seven serials to star Tyler. His starring westerns during the 30s varied in quality and rarely rose above the routine. With his steely eyes and intense demeanor, Tyler found himself working on the other side of the law in several higher-budgeted films, including Gone with the Wind and, as Luke Plummer, the man being hunted by John Wayne's Ringo Kid, and John Ford's return to westerns, the classic Stagecoach, in 1939. Tyler's demise was a unique death walk, where following the climactic shootout with Duke, he returns to the saloon with a sinister smile, only to collapse dead. It was a memorable scene that was repeated in the Errol Flynn western, San Antonio. Today, Tom Tyler is most remembered not for his westerns, but as a comic strip hero in the very first superhero serial, Shazam! That's right, film fans. It was The Adventures of Captain Marvel, a serial for Republic Pictures in 1941. When Frank Coughlin Jr. as teenage newsboy Billy Batson said Shazam, he turned into an adult, muscle-bound, flying superhero Captain Marvel, the Big Red Cheese. He turned into Tom Tyler. The serial became one of the most successful serials ever produced at Republic. Tom was physically suited for the role and looked the part, but was doubled in most of the action by legendary stuntman Dave Sharp. Tyler then starred as another comic strip hero in the 1943 Columbia serial The Phantom, which was based on the Lee Falk strip about a masked judge who ruled over faraway jungles. Unlike the other Columbia superhero serials where Batman and Superman looked a little chubby, Tom's trim physique was perfect and he looked the part of the ghost who walks. In between the two serials, Tom took over the role of Stony in Republic's Three Mosquitoes B-Western series. Earlier, Tom had appeared in the trio Western when John Wayne had played Stony. He was a villain in that one, and now, once again, became a cowboy hero with saddle pals Bob Steele and Jimmy Dodd. Other unusual roles for Tom include The Mummy's Hand as the title character, and as a Native American opposite Lucille Ball in Valley of the Sun for director George Marshall. After 1945, Tom no longer starred in films. He was struck with a crippling arthritis, which reduced him to small, supporting roles and would destroy both his career and his body. Only in his early 40s, Tom's painful physical complications crippled him, Tom was hired by his stagecoach director, John Ford, and they were expendable, and she wore a yellow ribbon. He also appeared in Red River, Bad Man's Territory, Return of the Bad Men, and Blood on the Moon, among others. Perhaps his last hurrah was a gathering of Western movie-leading men for the Roy Rogers film Trail of Robin Hood in 1950. He can be seen standing, surrounding Roy, with Tom Keen, Ray Crash Corrigan, Alan Rocky Lane, Monty Hale, Kermit Maynard, and William Farnham. Tom was hired for small parts in early TV westerns, including The Cisco Kid, The Range Rider, The Roy Rogers Show, and The Gene Autry Show. 
His last feature film was Cow Country in 1953, and his last appearance on film was an episode of the forgotten syndicated Western, Steve Donovan, Western Marshal. The pain got so bad that Tom left Hollywood altogether in 1952. He returned to Detroit, where he lived with his sister until the end. Tom Tyler died of a heart attack May 1, 1954, at the age of 50, tired, broken, and broke. 